Hey, how's it going, folks? Dan here with a new episode for you. Initially, this was a show only for patrons of the podcast, but upon listening to it, this is really more three arrows than Iron Dice content, although the line is a little blurry there. Anyway, enjoy. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Dan here with another bonus show, one that I have been very much looking forward to. The US midterms in which the Republicans achieved a historically bad result are now behind us. And historically really is the appropriate term here, considering that a midterm election in which the Republicans lost ground in terms of the raw number of state legislative seats has only happened twice in the last 100 years. The reason why I'm only talking about this now, because I wanted to wait for the Georgia runoff that happened this week. That one has now also been won by the Democratic candidate Raphael Warnock. So I think it's safe to say that Republicans took a big L, especially considering all the talk about a red wave sweeping the country. Given that the election happened in early November, most angles of commentary have been touched upon, so you don't need me to retread them here. But there is one aspect to this I haven't seen too much on, and that is what I want to focus on today. Because it finally gives me a reason to talk about US politics in a way that is somewhat optimistic, which I found very difficult to do recently. That optimism doesn't stem from the fact that the Democrats did good, but that Republicans did so poorly with the messaging they choose for this election. And of course that varies somewhat from state to state, but there is one consistent through line that Republicans were convinced of would get them the numbers that they needed, and it didn't. If there is one issue Republicans hammered on the most on a national level, its transphobia, and scaremongering about gender indoctrination. This isn't just something they use to win votes though, but goes hand in hand with a legislative push to discriminate against the LGBTQ community. A push that has enormously increased in the last two to four years. So I'm gonna paint a little picture for you here to show you just how much Republicans have gone in on attacking LGBTQ people recently. And then we'll take a look at how that worked out for them. This comes courtesy of NBC News, quote, State lawmakers have proposed a record 238 bills that would limit the rights of LGBTQ Americans this year, or more than three per day, with about half of them targeting transgender people specifically. Nearly 670 anti-LGBTQ bills have been filed since 2018, according to an NBC News analysis of data from the American Civil Liberties Union and LGBTQ advocacy group Freedom for All Americans, with nearly all of the country's 50 state legislators having weighed at least one bill. Throughout that time, the annual number of anti-LGBTQ bills filed has skyrocketed from 41 bills in 2018 to 238 bills in less than three months of 2022. And this year's historic tally quickly follows what some advocates had labeled the worst year in recent history for LGBTQ state legislative attacks, when 191 bills were proposed last year." End quote. Now, while the LGBTQ community as a whole is the target of these bills in terms of restricting school curriculums and the like, there is one aspect here I want to highlight today, and that is the targeting of trans people specifically. Because while discrimination of gay people under the guise of religious freedom goes back much further than the last five years, there is a huge uptick now wrapped up in the panic Republicans want to stir around trans people in sports, which bathrooms they are allowed to use, and more. There is also a specific reason for this, namely that Republican lawmakers believe that demonizing or discriminating against trans people specifically 
provides an in for them to target the entire LGBTQ community more broadly. It's not like conservatives in the US simply dropped their homophobia when gay marriage became legal with the Supreme Court ruling on Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015. The problem they have is that American society as a whole has become overwhelmingly hostile towards the discrimination their base wants to push. According to a poll by PRRI, nearly 80% of Americans support non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people, with Democrats coming in at 89%, independents at 82, and republicans at 65%. So what do you do when you have all this homophobia among your base and the religious right, but pushing the legislation they want is so unpopular? You divide and conquer. You pick out one specific target to chip away at that allows you to pay lip service towards the pro-gay stance of American society, while still being able to deliver for your homophobic and transphobic base. And that is where the attacks on trans people specifically come from. Now, I should say that it's not like gay people don't face similar attacks, like with the don't say gay bill in Florida that could see a teacher, for instance, punished if they tell their students that they have a partner of the same sex. But in the context of the midterms, Trans people seem to be the focus of Republicans' ire. This really began in 2016 with North Carolina's bathroom bill. That was the first very high-profile case I can think of. And from there, it just went up and up and up. According to the ACLU, in 2018, there were 19 bills of that ilk introduced. 2019 saw 25 that then more than doubled the year later with 60 bills before doubling again in 2021, reaching 131 bills. This year, 2022, as of October, that number has risen to 155. Now, not all of these passed, luckily, because Republicans aren't in power in every state, but the attempt itself puts a target on trans people's back for sure. Trans advocate Alyssa McKenzie from Orlando said in the Washington Post, quote, I don't know how to describe to somebody that isn't going through it how it feels to have the anxiety of waking up every morning not knowing whether your state is going to attack your right to exist, to do all of the things that so many people never ever have to question or think about. This isolation that Alyssa McKenzie is talking about becomes very apparent when you actually dig into the number of people targeted by these bills. The case of Utah, which became the 12th state to implement bans targeting transgender athletes, is worth looking at here. When the Republican state lawmakers initially passed a bill that would ban transgender students from participating in girls' sports, it was vetoed by the Republican governor of that state. Here is some of what Governor Spencer Cox wrote regarding his decision to veto this bill. Quote, Finally, there is one more important reason for this veto. I must admit, I am not an expert on transgenderism. I struggle to understand so much of it, and the science is conflicting. It's not, I want to add here. What in doubt, however, I always try to err on the side of kindness, mercy, and compassion. I also try to get proximate, and I'm learning so much from our transgender community. They are great kids who face enormous struggle. Now here comes the important part. Here are the numbers that have most impacted my decision. 75,000, 4, 86, and 56. 75,000 high school kids participating in high school sports in Utah. 4 transgender kids playing high school sports in Utah. 1. Transgender student playing girls sports, 86% of trans youth reporting suicidality, 56% of trans youth having attempted suicide. 4 kids and only one of them playing girls sports. That is what this is all about. 4 kids who aren't dominating or winning trophies and taking scholarships. 4 kids 
who are just trying to find some friends and feel like they are part of something. Four kids trying to get through each day. Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. I don't understand what they are going through or why they feel the way they do, but I want them to live." End quote. The response to this by the Republicans in the Utah Senate and House was basically saying, yeah, yeah, that's nice, uh, but we don't care. They overrode his veto and the law went into effect in July of 2022. For five trans people, one of them playing sports, four of them in high school, in a state of over three million people. Think of how fucking debauched and just consumed with hate you have to be to do that. <sighs> Something similar happened in Indiana, where Republican Governor Eric Holcomb vetoed a bill banning transgender women and girls from competing on public school sports teams consistent with their gender. He said at the end of his letter on the matter that, quote, the presumption of the policy laid out is that there is an existing problem in K-12 sports in Indiana that requires further state government intervention. It implies that the goals of consistency and fair in competitive female sports are not currently being met. After thorough review, I find no evidence to support either claim even if I support the overall goal, end quote. Not to mention that Indiana already has a policy in place since 2017 that requires transgender athletes wishing to compete in sports to apply for a waiver, confirming that they have been living as their gender identity for at least a year. Additionally, Transgender girls must prove they have undergone either hormone therapy for at least a year or surgery. Now get this. Since 2017, there have been two waiver applications. Not 2,000, not 200, not even 20. Two. But quote, no evidence, as Eric Holcomb put it, has never stopped the conservative movement as far as I know. And the state Senate and House voted to override that veto as well. That said, banning trans people from participating in sports is just one slice of the broader Republican assault right now. The arguably most alarming type of laws surround trans health care. This paragraph comes courtesy of the Washington Post that did a good write-up on this. Quote, these bills criminalize doctors who provide this highly individualized form of health care, which can include medical interventions such as puberty blockers and hormone therapy. They could also punish parents for supporting their kids as they seek treatment. States have also pressured hospitals and clinics that provide gender-affirming care to shutter or stop offering those treatments for trans people, both behind the scenes and through legislation threatening to withhold funding, end quote. The reason why this interference by lawmakers when it comes to healthcare for trans people specifically is so evil is because, again, the people who suffered the brunt of this interference are younger people who are forced to go through puberty by either a lack of healthcare or the treatment they need just outright being banned. And going through puberty and seeing your body change into something that doesn't match your self-image can be very traumatic. This has become such a big problem that the American Medical Association called upon states to stop interfering in healthcare of trans individuals in an open letter. It reads, Evidence has demonstrated that foregoing gender-affirming care can have tragic consequences. Transgender individuals are up to three times more likely than the general population to report or be diagnosed with mental health disorders, with as many as 41.5% reporting at least one diagnosis of mental health or substance use disorder. The increased prevalence of these mental health conditions is widely thought to be a consequence of minority stress the chronic stress from coping with societal stigma and discrimination because of one's gender identity and expression. Because of this stress, 
transgender minors also face a significantly heightened risk of suicide. Now, it's worth talking about the behind-the-scenes pressure here that the Washington Post article mentions because this is something that is way less out in the open than, you know, a bill. We can see a good example of this at the Children's Medical Center in Dallas that saw itself forced to disband its gender-affirming care program in November of last year. For many families in Texas and neighboring states, this was the only option they had to provide health care to their children, and often parents had to drive eight hours to an appointment at this medical center. This was by far the largest program for transgender youth in all of Texas. Now, what's kind of weird about this whole thing is that no one who either worked in the child care program or higher ups of the medical center responded when asked to comment for a piece on the 19th News website about why they are disbanding the program. It's obviously not a lack of demand considering the number of patients in gender-affirming care has only grown since they launched it. And then suddenly, they quietly close off the program to new patients and even scrub all references to it from their website. The just-mentioned 19th followed up this story in March this year after obtaining recordings of internal meetings at this clinic. The title of the piece is Political pressure led to shutdown of Texas' largest gender-affirming care program. And it basically details how the governor's office really put the screws onto this hospital over their program for trans youth. The people working there increasingly feared that they personally might be subject to lawsuits alleging child abuse for simply providing health care. That coupled with an onslaught of legislation aiming at restricting health care of trans youth, going as far as targeting doctors and parents, led to the shutdown of this medical center. In February of this year, Texas Governor Greg Abbott called upon licensed professionals and members of the general public to report the parents of transgender minors to state authorities if it appears the minors are receiving gender-affirming medical care. In addition, he made clear that the state law, quote, provides criminal penalties for failure to report such child abuse. There are really no words to describe how vile this stuff is because there is no other aim here than inflicting pain on trans children and their parents who are already facing a number of challenges as is. And the thing Republicans always bring up is how when you're a kid, you don't really have a full grasp of these issues. So what a person under 18 says about themselves shouldn't matter, basically. It's one of the cringy jokes they have, like, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a Transformer, haha. But of course, nobody believes that someone at the age of 12, let's say, can fully decide how they want to live the rest of their entire life. But that is literally what trans healthcare is for. That is why it even exists. So that a parent who sees their child struggle with their gender can take it to a doctor and together they can evaluate how to go forward. And if that kid is then prescribed puberty blockers, but down the line figures out that they are actually comfortable with the gender they were assigned at birth, they can decide with their doctor to ditch the medicine and go through puberty a little bit later in life. There are no two opinions on this. It's a net positive for them and for society at large to provide this health care. And this takes us to the other half of the attack on LGBTQ people and trans people more specifically. The legislation we've talked about doesn't just pop out of thin air. It's largely pushed by the conservative media machine, and the case of Texas is a good example of that. One reason why this became such a big deal in Texas is because of a child custody case in which the father of a child alleged that the mother was forcing their son to live as a girl. When this became a news story, the right, of course, jumped in on it, making it out to be an example of 
what they believe is happening all over the country. Liberal parents, or in this case, one parent, uh, colluding with ideologically motivated healthcare professionals, forcing their child to wear dresses, giving them hormones, etc. And this case is very intertwined with the program of the above-mentioned Children's Medical Center in Dallas, because that is where the mother went for treatment of her child. In interviews, the father of this child said that his kid dresses like a boy and understands himself as a boy whenever the kid is with him, but when it's not, the mother allegedly made this child wear dresses and only addressed it as a girl. What every single article on this by the right-wing press omits is that the child in question was diagnosed by multiple pediatricians to suffer from gender dysphoria, as well as there being a huge amount of testimony by school staff and family members that the child in question identifies as a girl without any instruction to do so from the mother, who, by the way, already had two daughters. So the narrative of this mother wanting to have a daughter is so bad she made her son undergo treatment made zero sense from the get-go. Senator Ted Cruz and Donald Trump Jr. got in on this, accusing the mother of abusing her child, and it wasn't long before Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeted the following. FYI, the matter of seven-year-old, insert dead name here, is being looked into by the Texas Attorney's General Office and the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, bringing down the full force of the state on this mother. The details of this case aren't that important. There is a very good deep dive on YouTube about it that I will link. But basically, the father of this girl is a religious zealot and didn't want to accept his daughter being trans. So he made it into a story of a crazy liberal mom abusing her child. In an interview, the father says, quote, It is totally against my religious beliefs to affirm him as a girl. Child Protective Services, who then investigated the mother at the behest of GOP officials, found no wrongdoing on her behalf, and that's basically it. All I can say is that it's incredibly tragic for this young girl who is already in a tough spot given the custody battle to be exploited like this by the right wing to drum up their transphobic base. And exploited for political clout, I should say, since her father then ran for office, plastering pictures of his kid all over his website and using the story for electoral gain. He lost in the primary though, so that's good. I guess. What's more interesting about this case to me is how the right-wing media lied about it and those lies directly leading to the governor's office pressuring the clinic this girl got her treatment at to a degree that it had to shut down its program. Because the other side of the Republican onslaught on trans rights revolves around conservative media. These bills or the media storm around the custody battle in Texas don't happen in a vacuum. The dynamic that unfolded in Texas is the current MO of right-wing media outlets where they take an event that might not even be a local news story and relentlessly hammer it and try to connect it to a broader trend that is supposedly sweeping the country. And the reason why they do this so much is because the hardcore base of the Republicans really loves stories that seem to reaffirm their transphobic beliefs. According to Media Matters, right-leaning Facebook pages earned nearly two-thirds of interactions on posts about trans issues. I would be surprised if the numbers from Fox News don't show a larger demand for stories shitting on trans people compared to other topics. So anything surrounding trans people hugely resonates within the conservative political sphere. Republican lawmakers see that and are increasingly incentivized to push for anti-trans legislation, no matter how nonsensical it is. 
If there is one person who, due to this insatiable transphobic thirst among the right, was successful in carving out his niche, it's a guy named Matt Walsh. Now, if you don't know who Matt Walsh is, he is someone who, until 2010, I can only assume, hung around under a gas leak until he decided to become a conservative commentator. Now, I don't have kids as of right now, but if I did, I would definitely want to keep them away from this guy because Matt Walsh seems unable to not talk about children in a very weird way, be it about how the age of consent is kind of iffy or children being sexualized by seeing drag queens or doctors supposedly mutilating children. Lots of crazy stuff, but what I appreciate about him is that Matt Walsh offers a clear view into the American conservative mind because he has no filter at all. With him, you get the pure essence of what conservatives believe, stripped of any lip service or moderation to make them seem less crazy. So it runs the gambit from thinking that trans people don't exist, it's all just a mental illness, being against gay marriage, saying that America lost its republic after Reconstruction, believing in the Great Replacement, take your pick. He is the guy who among the right made attacking LGBTQ people his claim to fame. Part of that is a documentary he made earlier this year that proposes to simply ask the question, what is a woman? In this documentary, he presents himself as this curious everyman and talks to academics, politicians, and people on the street about what a woman is. And in this documentary, Matt Walsh seems to struggle with a basic concept that most teenagers can understand, namely that while most people are assigned male or female at birth, what makes a woman is largely a collection of social signifiers. Because you have no idea what a person has between their legs when you meet them for the first time, usually. So you go by things like, do they have long hair? What does their voice sound like? What body type do they have? And so on. But there's no biological basis to women typically having long hair or shaving their legs. These are things society has agreed upon to be things women do. What we see as a woman, societally, is a question of language, not so much biology, if you get what I'm saying. It's pretty simple. There are many, many scenes in the documentary worth exploring, but one interaction in particular is very enlightening. And that is when Matt Walsh talks to a social scientist at a university. Walsh asks him, what is the difference between sex and gender? And the response he gets is this long-wielded answer detailing our modern understanding of how sex and gender are intertwined, but that gender is largely a social category. In the documentary, the answer the professor gives is kind of sped up and mashed together, but at the end, Walsh just asks confused, so is there a difference? It's supposed to be this haha man, this professor guy surely is boring moment, but really just showcases how inept Matt Walsh is in grappling with these issues. The rest of the documentary is not that different from the typical conservative propaganda pieces out there. Uh, one moment where Matt Walsh is talking to a man about hormone blockers is pretty instructive, in my opinion. Uh, I have a short clip for you here. And we're believing a pharmaceutical company, Lupron, hormone blockers, reversible, so they say. Well, the truth is, is that in 2003, Lupron was sued and deemed a criminal enterprise by the US government. They paid the most fine of any pharmaceutical company at that time, $874 million, wrote a check. Is Lupron chemical castration? Yes. This person brings up a drug named Lupron, being part of a sweeping effort to sterilize children, supposedly, and in the same breath mentions a billion dollar lawsuit. It's not outright said, but the impression the viewer gets is that this lawsuit and Lupron being prescribed to young trans individuals are somehow connected. 
Otherwise, why would you even bring this up in the same breath? Now, any person who has their senses together will hear this and think, what? That sounds ridiculous. And of course, when you look it up, you find out that not only did they settle this case in 2001, so 21 years ago, but that they had to pay this nearly billion dollar fine over Medicare fraud. This company had essentially bribed doctors to prescribe Lupron to elderly men for prostate cancer because that's what the drug is mainly used for. Now, the average eligibility age for Medicare is 65. For this case to be related to trans people in any way, there would have to have been an over 65-year-old male in the 90s who received Lupron as a puberty blocker from his doctor. I'm not a medical expert, but I'd be shocked if there was even a single case of this because, you know, not that many over 65-year-olds go through puberty. Dare I say, none at all. Now, I don't have time to debunk the entire documentary here, but this gives you an idea of the dishonesty involved. It basically exists to reaffirm people who are already, let's say, skeptical towards the existence of trans people. But I doubt anyone else will get anything out of it. Ultimately, there is nothing I could say about this documentary that would be as damning as Matt Walsh's own words when he appeared on the Joe Rogan show. Now, I'm going to play a clip for you here where Matt Walsh is asked, how many minors are currently on puberty blockers in the United States? Something he should have an easy time answering considering he made a freaking documentary on this. He's then fact-checked and yeah, take a lesson for yourself. How many people have had this done? Depends on what, I don't think we have exact numbers, but it's, if we're talking about the drugs, it's, I mean, millions. Um, are you talking uh, about hum hormone blockers? Yeah. Millions of kids have been on hormone blockers, really? Uh, I, I'm sure someone's going to fact check me on it, but my, my, my guess is that we're, in, we're into the millions now at this point. Yeah, that would be my guess. Um, uh, I, I can say for double mastectomies, the most re I read a report recently that um, there were over 1,000 done between 2016 and 2019. And when you compare that to how many were done between, you know, 2008 and 2015, it's just a, it's a massive increase. And uh, a th over a thousand girls had double gender, gender affirming double mastectomies in that in that time frame. And when and, you but say that's, girls, that, you're talking about prepubescent? Right, minors. Uh, and that's just up until 2019. And then we know that uh, there's been this exponential increase with all this stuff year over year. So um, it's it's a lot. It's too many. You know, one having this happen to one kid is way too many. It's a lot more than one. Yeah, look, if you're an adult and you want to do that and you understand who you are and what you are and this is how you feel you should progress, you're an adult. This is a free country. You should be able to do whatever you want. But when you're talking about doing that to children, the fact that so many people are on board and so many people are angry, if you have, like, people are going to be angry at us that we're having these conversations. Yeah, they will be. And I, and I also. I actually think that uh, that that this shouldn't this shouldn't be happening to. That's a, a very small number, if that's right. It I'll says kinda... over the last five years, there were at least four thousand seven hundred eighty adolescents who started puberty blockers and had a prior gender dysphoria diagnosis. This says it's kind of undercounted, but that's that would be a big less than a thousand people a year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I would guess you know hundreds of thousands at this, but I could be wrong. Million sounds great. <laughs> yeah, that could be wrong. Yeah, um, the media matters will have a fun with that clip. Yeah, Matt Walsh claims it was. Okay, let's go through this because this is just amazing that this guy who has made a name for himself as the right wing's top psychopath on transgender issues is off by a factor of one thousand when asked the most basic question you could think of. Imagine me going on the Joe Rogan show after I made a documentary called What is a Tiger? And when I'm asked how many tigers are left in the world, I go like, oh, you know, my guess is a couple of millions. And then when I'm fact-checked to my face and told the number of tigers is roughly 4,000, I go, 
yeah, probably in the hundreds of thousands. It's like, dude, you just guessed millions. Like, what are you even talking about? This is so embarrassing. I would consider, you know, drastic measures if this ever happened to me. Getting exposed as such a dumbass to millions of people. And yeah, Media Matters should have a field day with this because you're full of shit, Matt Walsh. Just incredible. And one thing I don't want to let slide because... Joe Rogan, frankly, is too stupid to be trusted with an issue like this. The vast, vast, vast majority of trans men, if they get mastectomies, aka top surgery, get it over the age of 18. The reason for that is that the body is still growing and getting this kind of surgery can be more complicated if your breasts are still in the process of forming. If you are below that age, let's say 16 or 17... There are a bunch of hurdles like consent of both parents, mental evaluation, and a team of doctors determining that it would be more dangerous to wait for this procedure than performing the procedure itself. It's much, much harder to get than Matt Walsh makes it out to be. Anyway, of course, this documentary is a huge success among the right, confirming all their beliefs about kooky liberals not even having a concept of what a woman is. Congress people mention it on the House floor in a positive way. It makes waves beyond the conservative sphere as Matt Walsh is invited onto Bill Maher. He and his documentary even get a fawning write-up in one of Germany's largest newspapers called Die Welt, calling him a conservative Michael Moore. So from their perspective, this is a huge success. Now, Republican lawmakers and strategists see how much trans issues resonate among their base and conservatives more broadly and tell themselves, hell yeah, this is how we're going to win the midterms. Forget the economy, forget anti-vax stuff, this is where it's at. This is going to fire up the religious right, the mega people, and get the independent voters on our side. So they pour a ton of money into anti-trans ads and I have a couple of stories for you here from before the midterms. Going as far back as March, there is a story by NBC News titled GOP Candidates Unleash Wave of Ads Targeting Transgender Rights. It reads, Two leading Republican Senate hopefuls in Pennsylvania are savaging each other in TV ads over who supported transgender surgery more. In Missouri, another GOP candidate for Senate surged when she criticized transgender swimmer Leah Thomas in a commercial. And in Alabama, a charter school for transgender kids has been invoked in ads as an issue in the Republican primary for governor. Like never before, Republicans in primaries across the country have made attacking transgender rights central to their paid media campaigns and stump speeches, focusing on issues of education, gender transitioning, and sports, according to the ad-tracking firm Ad Impact. Further down in the article, they interview a Republican consultant, and this is really funny and provides an insight into their rationale. This guy says, Voters overall are nowhere near Democrats on this, and the hard, woke left. There is a biological difference between men and women. Once in a while, you find an issue that is your opponent's Achilles heel, where they are way over their skis. Democrats are stuck on this, because if they step out of line, they get smacked as transphobic. Keep this guy in mind for later when we discuss the election results. This article mentions $4.5 million in ads targeting transgender rights, which isn't that much money in the grand scheme of things, but that number only increased from when this NBC piece was published. In May, reported by USA Today, Republicans see anti-trans bills as key to midterm victory. September of 2022, also by NBC News, conservative group releases anti-transgender political ads in Michigan. The byline being, American Principles Project announced that it will spend millions in battleground states to expose Democrats' transgender radicalism. October 10th, in Bloomberg, GOP looks to fire up base with attacks on transgender rights. Getting close to the midterms here now, November 1st, in Politico, ads targeting transgender kids flood swing states. A group started by Trump administration alums is spending millions of dollars 
on battleground mailers and radio ads. Looking at all these headlines, you can really see how they went all in on this. And I have one more piece for you by NPR, published five days before the election. Right-wing groups spend millions of dollars on ads targeting transgender kids. Ahead of election day in the high-stakes 2022 midterm elections, right-wing groups have spent tens of millions of dollars on anti-transgender ads in battleground states. The narrator of an America First legal radio ad accuses President Biden of pushing children to take cross-sex hormones medication and get gender-affirming surgery. The Biden administration is pushing radical gender experiments on children, changing their names, clothes, identities and bodies, the narrator says. They want boys in our daughters' bathrooms and sports teams. Conservative estimates on just how much Republican candidates and PACs spend on ads targeting trans children mainly come in at around $50 million. $50 million. In Michigan, which is a key battleground state, there were more ads on trans people in sports than any other campaign issue, be it gas prices, inflation, or what have you, all paled next to the onslaught on trans people Republicans believed would be key to their victory. Okay, Republicans spent all this money, talk about trans people nonstop on Fox News or campaign trails, and you hear lots of talk about the red wave that's going to sweep the country. I have a little compilation for you here, compiled from various Fox News programs by the Washington Post. Red wave rising. That is the focus of tonight's angle. It's, it's going to be a wave, wave election, election and you're going to lose the Senate. And I'll bet you $1,000 right now. The knives are being sharpened right now for Joe Biden. You know, Democrats are going to get crushed on November 8th because a red wave is coming. But I'm betting that Joy will learn two new words on Tuesday. It's red wave. How big could that looming red wave get? We begin this Sunday morning with expectations of a red wave this Tuesday. I think this election is going to be a red wave. I think we're going to win. You know what? I, I think, you know, your predictions of a red wave are accurate. And the reason I say that is because now even the mainstream media is catching up. We've been hearing, is it going to be a red wave? Is it going to be a red tsunami? I think it's going to be a red hurricane. When the red wave comes, and it is coming, Joe Biden's political utility is over. Are we in for a red wind here or a red wave? Red wave or red tsunami? What are you feeling today? I'm feeling red wave. And don't listen to the lies they're spewing that this could take days or days, you know, to know who won. This is total BS. A wave like this, we should know that, that, that night, basically, who won the Senate and the House. Anything that happens Wednesday into Thursday is gravy. And right out the back door, I've got a tropical storm brewing right right now. I think they're saying could be a category one by the end of the day. However, let me tell you what is a storm, that red wave. I'm telling you, if there's any indication based upon what we're seeing this morning, somebody made a surfboard, said the red wave is coming. Now election day comes. Early on November 8th, a confident Matt Walsh tweets out, the pollsters may not be asking about it, but there is no doubt that the Democrat Party was partially doomed by its decision to go all in on gender ideology. We successfully made this a losing political issue for them. A couple of hours later, the election results come in, and what happens? Republicans get fucking trounced. They lose seats everywhere except for New York and Florida. Michigan, a state that Trump won in 2016, and where Republicans spent more on ads about trans people than anything else. Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer wins her re-election in a landslide. In Pennsylvania, Democrats even pick up a Senate seat as John Fetterman leaves his opponent in the dust. In Arizona, Nevada, and New Hampshire, all states where it was supposed to be a toss-up, the Democrats come out on top. Republicans are able to take the House, but only by a slither. Shortly before the runoff in Georgia, Republican candidate Herschel Walker makes a last effort to bring him over the finish line by airing an ad where he talks to a swimmer from Kentucky that had to compete against a trans woman. Shortly after, he loses as well. Needless to say, Republicans got owned big time. I reckon that Republican consultant who described trans issues as the Democrats' Achilles heel is in for some uncomfortable meetings now. Considering what Republicans were expecting, these midterm results were nothing short of a disaster. Now, why is that? Obviously, there are a lot of reasons. 
backlash from overturning Roe v. Wade is probably the single biggest reason behind their defeat. But there's also a point to be made regarding Republicans hammering trans issues prior to this election. Turns out their base is so far to the right, so far removed from the average person that a lot of people were just put off by their messaging. They saw Matt Walsh's nonstop rambling about children's genitals and thought, get away from me, you creepy weirdo. All while Democrats didn't run any ads talking about trans issues. So it's not even like Democratic messaging was just more convincing on this, but that Republican messaging was just so off-putting to the people in the middle. And I don't want to pretend that every independent voter is a strong supporter of trans rights, of course, but the hysteria created by Republicans around trans people existing in society did not do anything for them. Republicans were just too weird and creepy around this issue for the majority of voters. And I think that is a reason to be optimistic. The same election saw a number of LGBTQ candidates winning for the first time in some states. And in general, I think we can see this election result as a big rebuke of Republican anti-LGBTQ efforts. And this is where I was initially going to end the show today leaving on a positive note at least once in a while. But then something happened that casts all of this in a different light. That something being the shooting in Colorado Springs, where a gunman shot five people at an LGBTQ club. And this is really just part of the trajectory we have talked about so far. And I'm going to show you how using Matt Walsh as an example. After the Republicans fell short in the midterms, there was this very brief moment where they were kind of just stunlocked, looking at themselves and asking what went wrong here, looking at themselves and asking what went wrong. Matt Walsh tweeted on November 9th, most Americans are widely dissatisfied with the direction of the country, but Republicans weren't able to harness that dissatisfaction. That speaks to a party without any kind of coherent or compelling national message. We need new leadership top to bottom. Really funny seeing Matt Walsh demand new leadership when, dude, that was you. You massively contributed to making anti-trans hysteria the Republicans' national message. Okay, so it's right after the midterms. And you see some analysts go the typical route of saying, you know, the Republicans really got to take a look at themselves and moderate and get back to kitchen table issues, blah, 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 as if that was ever going to happen. And this is where those people have it backwards. Republicans didn't just run an anti-LGBTQ campaign because they thought this would be a winning issue, but because they genuinely believe this stuff. The topics they focus on stem out of bigotry more than anything else. This is a genuine campaign of, I don't know how else to put it, extermination. They want LGBTQ people and trans people above all, to be removed from society. Their focus is not a strictly political calculation. And you can see that by them going right back at it after suffering a staunch defeat politically. On the same day that Matt Walsh said the Republican Party lacks a coherent national message, he tweeted, We're full steam ahead here in Tennessee. Today the Protecting Children from Gender Mutilation Act was officially filed. It will ban the mutilation and drugging of gender-confused children and provide victims the right to sue for damages. We're still getting wins on the board. And this is one of Matt Walsh's passions, if you're not aware. That passion being actually putting children in danger. A couple of months ago, in early August, he went on air and accused Boston Children's Hospital, among others, of, quote, butchering, mutilating, and sterilizing their young patients, and said that we have to stop making it so easy on them. Walsh wasn't the only guy who talked about this, but one of many right-wing mouthpieces demonizing this clinic, claiming they are doing hysterectomies on kids and so on. Shortly after, the people working there received death threats, phone calls, and a flood of hateful emails. On August 30th, the hospital had to go into temporary lockdown because of a bomb threat. 
Another bomb threat came in on September 9th and a third one last month in which the caller specified he placed the explosives in the section of the hospital responsible for gender-affirming care. All of this based on total lies. This children's hospital did never offer gender-affirming hysterectomies to girls under the age of 18. Never happened. This alone would be awful enough, but shortly after his first accusation in August, he leveled, he leveled similar accusations at the Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Walsh called out doctors by name on his show and said they castrate, drug and mutilate children to make money. This got gobbled up and spread around the right-wing political sphere, and it wasn't long until Tennessee Governor Bill Lee and other Republicans in the state called for an investigation into the clinic. Walsh supposedly met with Tennessee lawmakers about a bill that would force it to shut down. Same spiel as in Boston, tons of death threats against doctors or other people working at the clinic. And on October 7th, 2022, Vanderbilt Medical Center announced that it would pause gender-affirming surgeries for minors. And that word minors can be misleading because since 2018, this clinic had performed five such surgeries annually, all the patients being over 16 and having parental consent with none of them receiving genital surgery. This is what Matt Walsh means. This is what Matt Walsh means when he says putting wins on the board. On November 19th, he was able to put another win on the board as a 22-year-old gunman entered a LGBTQ club in Colorado Springs, killed five people, and severely injured 18 more. Usually when something like this happens, something meaning an act of violence that is obviously partially motivated by the bigotry and hatred for minorities in the right-wing political sphere, the response is denial. The right wing denies that this has anything to do with their rhetoric and pretends to not even understand the allegation leveled at them. A good example of this is the Canadian mask shooting in 2018 that the shooter himself claimed was caused by his fear of Muslims being terrorists. As part of the sentencing, his internet activities became public knowledge and part of them was him visiting Ben Shapiro's Twitter page 93 times in the month before the shooting. Also Tucker Carlson's page close to 50 times and Coulter, Alex Jones. Now, I'm not going to claim that a perfectly adjusted human being will turn into a mass murderer simply by being exposed to right-wing rhetoric, obviously. But there are plenty of people out there, mostly young men, that aren't well-adjusted. And if your political movement thrives off of hate and fear, of course these men will have an easier time latching onto that cause compared to others. As a response, Ben Shapiro condemned the mass shooter and said that it was ridiculous that the left pretends someone will start murdering people just because they're a fan of his tweets, which of course nobody is saying. But that is really not important to what Ben is trying to do here. The goal is to deflect and hope everyone forgets about it quickly, while engaging in the exact same rhetoric until the next shooting happens. We saw a little bit of that after the shooting in Colorado Springs. Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert tweeted that she is praying for the victims and their families. Very thoughtful to pray for the people she demonizes on a daily basis. But the tone from the right shifted relatively fast. Because of course, a tweet like the one from Lauren Boebert rings completely hollow as the shooting is clearly the result of the hysteria the right wing has created around LGBTQ people. So instead, people like Ben decide to go on the offensive. After the shooting, Ben Shapiro tweeted, The quest by the Democratic leadership and media to link a horrifically evil shooting at a Colorado gay club to anyone who doesn't support a progressive social agenda is ongoing and terrible for the country. It's a cynical game only one side plays, and it's trash. Matt Walsh follows suit and tweets, Leftists are using a mass shooting to try and blackmail us into accepting the castration and sexualization of children. These people are just beyond evil. I have never felt more motivated to oppose everything they stand for with every fiber of my being. Despicable scumbags. I feel like a couple of years ago, this pearl clutching 
at anyone suggesting the right wing calling LGBTQ people evil, perverted, disgusting groomers that mutilate children leads to violence against LGBTQ people could have worked, but the calling for violence has become so obvious that it really doesn't. The mask has simply slipped too much by now. Nobody believes that Matt Walsh isn't either happy or is thinking something along the lines of, well, they had it coming about this shooting. Because he wants LGBTQ people or drag queens to fear for their life if they are part of something he objects to, like reading books to children. Again, you don't have to take my word for it. Here is what Matt Walsh had to say about the shooting on his show. According to the left, the drag queen child combination has become dangerous. They say it's a lightning rod for violent backlash, right? That's what they say. And it's greatly exaggerated, of course. Mostly it's invented out of whole cloth, actually. But, but even by their version of events, if it's causing this much chaos and violence, why do you insist on continuing to do it? If, if according to you, it's like putting people's lives at risk, if, if the effort to have men cross-dress in front of children is putting people's lives at risk, why are you still doing it? Is it that important to you? Now, not only does Matt Walsh in doing this why are you hitting yourself routine here fail to grasp why people insist on being able to do something that is perfectly within their rights, he almost spills the beans a little bit. Because what goes unsaid is that, yes, I do believe you deserve to get shot if you are at an event where drag queens read books to children. At this point, you probably don't need me to tell you how despicable people like Matt Walsh and Ben Shapiro are. They prove that themselves virtually every day and are perfectly aware of what they're doing. Their goal, and by extension the goal of the right wing in the United States, is for LGBTQ people to either not exist at all or not be part of the public sphere in any way. A political defeat, like we just saw, won't make them stop working towards that goal. I think we all know that. But here's the thing. We have just seen the American public reject their anti-gay, anti-trans efforts in a way that could almost not have been more clear. So if you are part of the LGBTQ community, you might find some solace in the fact that the average American voter finds Matt Walsh ranting himself into a frenzy about trans people just as creepy and weird as you and I do. There will always be bitter hate preachers that fear the way of human progress, and sometimes they get their way. But if the midterms show anything, it's that the majority of the electorate is not on board with hate and intolerance, and that if we keep working on it, the Ben Shapiros and Matt Walsh's of the world will be left behind while the rest of us move forward in universal brotherhood.